I am acutely mindful of the fact that I stand before you today. The reason why has very little with who I am and a whole lot about the subject of my talk tonight, which is the man who we've come to honor this evening, Charles Evans Hughes. Uh, no American lawyer, no American judge more dutifully serve the rule of law than use, and it is one of the very great privileges of my professional life to be able to talk with this very great man. So let's begin the story of this evening with the year immediately before the critical events take place, and you'll see why that's important. 1919, the year historian Ted Widmer calls the year of the great cracker. Save perhaps 1967, Civil War, maybe the Revolutionary Period, it stands amongst one of the worst years in American history in terms of turmoil and political unrest. It seemed as though everything that could go wrong in 1919 went wrong. Now, the year started with great promise. New Year's Day, January 1, 1919, it was only a few months after Americans celebrated the end of the Great War. The war to end all wars, World War I. Soldiers would be coming home and people were excited, but with each passing day and week, it became more and more clear that, or at least it appeared as though the country was coming unmoored and dangerously um, confused and frightened. Uh, like I said, everything that could go wrong did go wrong. The economy was in a shambles. There was a stock market collapse. Millions of soldiers are coming back from overseas. There are no jobs for them. The cost of living was exploding. Um, it rose by 99% over a five-year period. Race relations were disintegrating rapidly. 25 American cities had riots precipitated by violence against African Americans. Labor strike at an all-time high, 2,600. 2,600 strikes that year. The Spanish flu, the great influenza from 1919 to 1920, took the lives of 675,000 Americans and millions of people overseas. And what made it all the more disturbing and terrifying was that there were unprecedented acts of domestic terrorism. There were a series of anarchist bombings in April. There were 30 mail bombs that were sent to prominent Americans, including Supreme Court justices like Oliver Wendell Holmes. Um, on June 2nd, 1919, there were eight more bombings, mail bombs and other bombs that detonated in front of the homes of prominent individuals, including the Attorney General of the United States, A. Mitchell Palmer, his R Street townhouse had a bomb detonated on the footstep while his wife and children were in the home. At the same time, with all of that, and all of the turmoil and unrest overseas, it seemed as though the world was coming apart, at least to millions of Americans. The Bolshevik Revolution, when an extreme faction led by Vladimir Lenin and Leon Trotsky assumed power in Russia and abolished all other political parties and rivals. As the years moved on, it seemed as if communism was on a march, and it was on a march. In 1919, Hungary turned into a communist state. In Italy and France and Vienna, it seemed as though those countries were going to ultimately succumb to communism. There was a communist uprising in Germany. And all of these events at once created what historians refer to as the Great Red Scare of 1919 to 1920 a mass delirium. It was as if the country had temporarily lost its sentences. People thought that there were millions and millions of radicals and anarchists and communists and socialists that were poised to overthrow the government by force. None of that was true. But craven politicians used the opportunity to distract attention from the real issues of the day, some of which I described, by scapegoating these problems with radicals. It was an easy mark. So, what happened? In addition to this mass hysteria, the Attorney General, the same man I mentioned, A. Mitchell Palmer, assisted by his young aide, J. Edgar Hoover, 
launched a series of mass raids against alleged radicals and subversives throughout multiple cities in America. Thousands of people were arrested. It was a civil rights disaster. People were arrested without search warrants, unreasonable searches and seizures galore, even acts of torture. For those of you who came in a little bit before the lecture, you might have seen on the screens, the film clips of the Pomerites with people being thrown into paddy wagons. And if they were aliens, they would be deported. The most famous deportee would be Emma Goldman, Red Emma Goldman from Rochester, New York. She had her citizen stripped, and if you saw the film clips, you would have seen her and 249 alleged radicals put on a ship and sent to Russia, and you would have seen the cartoon, The Wave Bye Bye. So the country had lost its senses. Let's fast forward to January 7, 1920, New York State. The New York Tribune reported that day that there were 20,000 aliens in New York organized and committed to the overthrow of the government. Not true, sure, but it was reported as fact. On that same day, January 7, 1920, the New York State Legislature was going to have its opening session. Ordinarily a festive affair, People are going to be sworn in, friends and families come for the event, the sergeant of arms is selected, leaders are picked. In the assembly there were 150 members, 110 of them were Republicans, Republicans controlled the assembly, 35 were Democrats, and there were five duly elected members of the Socialist Party. The speaker of the New York State Assembly was a manufacturer from Oswego, New York, by the name of Thaddeus C. Sweet an arch conservative, and also the longest serving speaker at that time in New York history. He was bored with being speaker. He wanted to be governor. And he was looking for an issue that would propel him into the governor's mansion. Well, he found it in the form of the Red Scare mania. His target, the five elected socialists. All of them were from either um, some were from the Lower East Side, Harlem, the Bronx. All of them were from districts with um, heavy populations of Eastern Europeans and Jews. Um, all of them were highly sophisticated. They were young. The average age was 32. They wrote books. There was a poet amongst them. These were very smart, very able, very devoted people. Note this. They were right-wing socialists. I know you're wondering, what does that mean? To be a right-wing socialist was, well, what Franklin Delano Roosevelt promoted with the New Deal. They believed in things like Social Security and regulating utilities. They were against the death penalty. They were opposed to the entry um, of the United States into World War I. That was, didn't seem like a radical position. Woodrow Wilson ran and got reelected in 1916 because he kept us out of war. But they were accused by authentic radicals as being socialists. <laughs> they were not committed to the violent overthrow of government. They believed in the ballot box and democratic processes. The Socialist Party, just note this, in 1920 was a authentic factor in New York and American politics. Just around this period, 1918, 10 of the 150 members of the assembly were socialists. The mayor of Schenectady, George Lund, was a socialist. In 1912, Eugene Debs uh, collected 6% of the vote running head-to-head -head against Theodore Roosevelt and Woodrow Wilson. They were forced to be reckoned with. They had their own newspapers that were widely subscribed. They were to be taken seriously. And they were a ripe target for Thaddeus Sweet. And so, Two and a half hours into the opening day of the legislative session, Speaker Sweet came out of his office, ascended the rostrum, and directed the sergeant of arms to bring the five socialists before him like prisoners in the dock. He then proceeded to harangue them. He said that they believed in things that were inimical to the best interests of the state and nation. He said that they didn't belong to an authentic political party, but rather a membership organization committed to the overthrow of government. He pointed out that they were opposed to America's entry into World War I. 
applause broke out in the assembly chamber. This is the heart of the Red Scare with what the speaker was saying. The speaker welcomed a resolution to be introduced that would require the socialists to be suspended pending a trial at which they could prove that they were eligible and fit to serve in the assembly. The speaker then rushed a roll call vote and 140 members of the New York State Assembly voted to oust them subject to a trial. Sentence first, verdict second. Only six people voted in dissent. Four of them were the socialists, two Democrats who happened to be elected in districts with heavy blocks of socialist voters. The news detonated in the front pages of newspapers throughout New York State and the country. The middle of the Red Scare, people were uh, accustomed to one more extraordinary extreme act after another. But at first, people couldn't quite get their bearings. The next day, only a couple of papers had editorials. The then conservative New York Times applauded the actions of the assembly. The New York Globe was opposed and the socialist call was opposed as well. But people were scratching their heads. The majority voting to get rid of people because of nothing they did as individuals, but because they purportedly belonged to a party with beliefs different than the majority. In the height of the Red Scare, it took enormous courage to stand up for high principle. Anyone who tried to speak out against things like what Speaker Sweep had done courted ruin. It took incredible intestinal fortitude in the face of the public temper at the time to rise to the occasion. It was entirely possible that this incident would have been like the Palmer raids, which catapulted A. Mitchell Palmer into front runner status for the Democratic nomination for president in 1920. But there was such a person who was ready to stand up for high principle. That was Charles Evans Hughes. Charles Evans Hughes in January of 1920 was in private life. In 1916, he stepped off the United States Supreme Court to run for president of the United States. On election day in 1916, he went to sleep thinking he was the next president of the United States. He lost California by about 3,000 votes. He was out of a job. He was the first citizen of New York. He was the most respected individual in the state, certainly the most respected lawyer. And he was president of the great New York County Lawyers Association at the time. He took that office in that previous May after serving two years as president of the New York State Bar Association, which made him president in only a couple of months after he lost the election. But at this moment, he's president of NICA. Hughes was an extraordinarily um, composed man, circumspect, spoke carefully with temperate and judicious language. Some people who knew him as a, a Supreme Court justice, as a two-term governor, thought he had a chilly or austere exterior. His nickname was the Bearded Iceberg. <laughs> but he loved his family deeply. That was his interior and his personal life. His friends and family thought him witty and a great conversationalist. And his children were the light of his lives. In January 1920, Charles Evans Hughes' heart was breaking. His eldest daughter, by some accounts the light of his life, Helen Hughes, was 28 years old. She was dying of tuberculosis. She was living with Antoinette Hughes, Charles Evans Hughes' wife, in Glens Falls. Hughes would commute um, to Glens Falls on the weekends and then return to New York on Sunday. She died four months later, in April of 1920. Hughes' youngest daughter, Elizabeth was 12 years old. She had been diagnosed with juvenile diabetes. This is before insulin was available. It was believed to be a fatal disease. Hughes was losing two of his daughters at the same time that the socialist episode was breaking in the newspapers. There's no contemporaneous documentation of how this was relevant to what he thought on January 8, 1920, but we know this. He was furious. He was angry beyond comprehension. His friends and family thought that this was the next president of the United States. Charles Evans Hughes, and he only raised his hand. He would have been the nominee, and he would have been elected 
How do we know? Warren Harding was elected in November 1920. But this was not a time in his life where he was very interested in anything like career advancement or being restrained in the face of a monstrous violation of the principles of representative government. And so he penned an open letter that was published on the front pages of newspapers throughout the state and nation on January 9, 1920. I commend the letter to all of your attention. It is an extraordinary state paper. You'll see a block quote that I have, but amongst the language that he used was he described the Republican speaker of the New York State Assembly, by the way, uses the titular leader of the Republican Party. He describes Thaddeus Sweet's actions as not, in his judgment, American governments. The battle lines were drawn. For much of the country, it was Charles Evans Hughes versus Thaddeus Sweet. The press ate it up. But Hughes was not the only person who was prepared to express a strong opinion about what had occurred. Two individuals, two men deeply committed to good government, Thomas Thatcher, the son of the founder of the Simpson Thatcher firm, and C.C. Birmingham, one of the great figures of New York life, had an audacious idea. And it was basically based on the fact that the New York City Bar Association, the following week, was going to have its annual meeting. Thatcher tried to get the leadership of the City Bar Association to do something, or to take a stand, but they turned him down. But him and Birmingham drafted a petition, a stunningly strong petition. It says, among other things, this proposed petition that they would submit to the city bar at the annual meeting, that if the city bar adopted it, that it was unalterably opposed to what the assembly did. And it described the acts of the assembly as, quote, un-American. And then Thatcher and Birmingham and others proceeded to try to get as many luminaries to sign this petition as possible. And they truly collected a host of worthies. That's Thomas Jefferson's phrase for the signers of the Declaration of Independence. It included two future Chief Justices of the Supreme Court, Hughes and Harlan Fist Stone, distinguished federal judges, a who's who of lawyers. Their names continue to occupy the great law firms of New York today. The petition, became public shortly after um, they were signed by 35 individuals. And you will see what the reaction was in the media and across the state. Hughes was violently attacked rhetorically on the floor of the New York State Assembly. One assemblyman rose and called him a four-flusher, disloyal, pro-German during World War II. This is Charles Evans Hughes. And there was wild applause when Hughes was criticized. The city, the city bar as well for even trying to make the petition happen was wildly criticized. That was the front page of the New York Times, by the way, above the fault. So we move to January 14, 1920, the city bar debate. It was no, unlike any debate the city bar has ever seen before or since. The issue of the proposed resolution was debated for about two hours and 45 minutes. You had the greatest lawyers in the city of New York. Those who were against the revolution were determined to defeat it and fight to the finish. There were 10 procedural amendments. The president had to take Robert's rules of order and master it, one motion after another to try to stop the vote. Hughes presented the resolution, read it out loud and made a speech, received applause. The final vote, was 174 to 117 in favor of the resolution. The resolution called for the president of the city bar, John Milburn, to select a committee of lawyers who would go to Albany and take whatever positions they deemed appropriate to defend the principles of representative government. The five people that were selected, led by Charles Evans Hughes, were amongst the most extraordinary and distinguished lawyers at the time. I just pull your attention to the bottom row. You will see two future, one past and one future president of the New York County Lawyers Association. Morgan O'Brien uh, immediately preceded Hughes as president of uh, NYCLA. And the man to the right is Joseph Proskauer, who in the 40s became a president. 
He at the time was widely regarded as the legal genius um, in uh, the Al Smith's orbit. Um, and all of these people in their own way were selected strategically to make a statement. And of course, with views at the front, they made a statement. Well, the resolution and the approval by the city bar made national news. Let me show you how much national news. That's right. The front page of the New York Times, above the fold, Bar Association to defend the socialists. And if that wasn't enough on the front page, the entire petition was also there, including the signatories, all 35 on, left, on the front page of the New York Times. And so, those who were opposed to what the city bar had just done decided that they would continue to fight the fight, and they thought the place to do it was at the New York State Bar Association, which had its annual meeting at the time, which was also held at the City Bar Association. And a resolution was put before the floor of the membership at the time, actually taking a contrary position to what the City Bar did. Charles Evans used Rose and would have none of it. And made a speech in which this judicious, this circumspect, this careful man described the actions of the New York State Assembly as the most Bolshevist act in the history of the state. <laughs> Call the assembly Bolsheviks. The vote, fiercely contested, was 131 to 100 for an amended resolution, which in effect supported the socialists. So you had Nyquist's president taking a leadership position. You had the city bar association condemning the acts. And then you had the state bar association working together as a team, collaboratively, in the face of this monstrous evasion of representative government. So let's go to the first day of the so-called trial of the socialists. January 20, 1920. The picture that you're looking at on the far right as you're looking at it, that's Joseph Proskauer. It was sub-zero coal, Hughes is in the middle, and Lewis Marshall is on the left. He was, at the time, amongst the most eminent constitutional lawyers of the day. So they were there for the trial, and this was going to be, in Thaddeus Sweet's mind, a absolute political windfall for him. This was his platform to be running for governor. He was going to show the world New York is not going to tolerate radicals. He turned the assembly chamber into a courtroom. I don't know if anybody, any here has seen the assembly chamber. It's not really that large a space. 2,000 people were in the chamber. Reporters came from as far away as St. Louis, that was West, to be there. There were more reporters at the trial on the opening day that had ever covered a public event in the history of Albany. The jury was the Assembly Judiciary Committee. And these were the people who were poised to hold a political party on trial. Predominantly Republican. Uh, the chairman was Lewis Martin, who some of you may know his most famous feat, it wasn't this trial, was the Martin Act, which the Attorney General's office has made aggressive use of. Uh, but these individuals were going to be, you know, holding, at least in the first instance, a supposed trial. They claimed they were going to use the rules of the New York State Supreme Court during the trial. But the courtroom, if you will, the assembly chamber by those people who had seen it, Proskauer in his biography sort of describes it as one of the most electric things he'd ever seen in his life. The Judiciary Committee came out at about 11.30ish um, to begin the trial. And Charles Evans Hughes, um, as President McNamara noted, Robert Jackson famously said, looked like God, acted like God, was in the back of the chamber. As soon as the gavel went down, he stood and made a beeline to the Judiciary Committee, demanding to be heard. The chairman tried to ignore him for a time, but you said, Mr. Chairman. And the chairman said, Governor Hughes. And then, Governor Hughes proceeded to say that he was there not on behalf of the socialists as individuals, but on behalf of the cause of representative governance, representative government, and that fundamental principles of constitutional law be applied. 
the chairman cut him off and said, no, no, we have some housekeeping issues to do. Please hold your, hold your file. And they then proceeded to talk about a variety of miscellaneous kinds of things, at which point Hughes grew impatient and then began to harangue the chairman, saying that the socialists should be restored to the privilege of their seat. If they had done something wrong, charges should be properly weighed. They should have an opportunity to defend themselves. And while any trial was pending, they surely shouldn't be suspended. They should be able to sit and represent their constituents. The chairman said reluctantly, wasn't so reluctant. Reluctantly, he said, well, they can't hear from Governor Hughes. They had made a decision before they came out that if they allowed some parties acting as amicus to be heard, like Hughes wanted to be heard, everybody would have to be heard, but basically for a month. Hughes then proceeded, they had briefs, actually brilliant and seminal arguments were made in these briefs. At the time, the law pretty much allowed the assembly to determine what its qualifications are without regard to whether or not it was based on political speech or belief. Um, Hughes starts handing out the brief to reporters that are around that. The chairman is incensed, at which point Hughes is incensed. He picks up his stuff, he puts it in his briefcase, he turns around and walks out and in one fell swoop, he turned the proceedings into a farce. This was the day when Thaddeus Sweet was going to have a public relations bonanza. It was a public relations disaster. The press, as you can see from the headline in front of you, covered this as, are you kidding? The two-term governor of the state of New York, an associate justice of the Supreme Court, a candidate for president of the United States, New York's first citizen, he can't be heard use turn the proceedings into a farce. But the assembly couldn't be sick. They had to have the trial. Lasted through March, it was 21 days long. I read the transcript, it goes on and on. There were a few moments of high drama. Mostly it was farce. At the end of the process, on March 30, the Judiciary Committee voted seven to six to expel the socialists. Now they didn't have the decision. The decision was ultimately for the assembly to make, which takes us to April Fool's Day. The debate actually started the day before. It lasted 22 hours. The socialists were called traitors and dogs and worse. It went on and on. And in the height of prohibition, yes, this is true, the height of prohibition, assemblymen were walking around with flasks of whiskey in their back pocket. Reporters who covered it said that the cloakroom in the assembly smelled like a saloon. Well, the final vote was, you know, ultimately and overwhelmingly to expel the socialists from the assembly. And at one stroke, 60,000 New Yorkers found their legally elected representatives removed from office. Hughes was found in the city and he gave a quote. I'll read it to you. You can see it. Those who make their patriotism a vehicle for intolerance are very dangerous friends of our institutions. A final coda on what happened. Uh, in August, Governor Al Smith called for a special election, which took place on September 16, 1920. Democrats and Republicans ran what used to be called fusion tickets in order to beat the socialists. So the Republicans and Democrats cross endorsed single candidates. All five socialists were reelected. They presented themselves on September 21 to be in the assembly. By the way, all of these people were incumbents, save one. They had all served previous terms in the assembly. Assembly couldn't help itself. Three of them were expelled, and the other two resigned in solidarity. The assembly's actions marked a national turning point. Use delegitimized the ouster and ushered in the end of the Red Scare. The nation at this time was bedrugged by propaganda. There was a fever, a mass delirium. But what Hughes did by his actions is turn all of this into an epic joke. Cartoonists from St. Louis and across the nation mocked the assembly. And the American people regained their sense of humor. The fever finally broke. The Red Scare was over, the Roaring Twenties began. So what happened to the protagonists of this story? What happened to them? Where did they go? What did they become? Thaddeus C. Sweet, 
the man who wanted to be governor, he didn't get the nomination. The man who got the Republican nomination to run for governor in 1920 was Nathan Miller, the president of the New York State Bar Association. I have no such ambitions, by the way. <laughs> Miller won. He stepped down as president of the State Bar and he defeated Al Smith, incredibly. It was 1920 and it was a huge Republican year. By the way, Hughes got reelected two years later and then ran for uh, Smith and then ran for president in 1928. So Sweet didn't become governor. He did get elected to Congress and ultimately died in a plane crash in 1928, making him the first person to ever, any member of Congress, to die in an aeronautics event. What about the five socialists, these Lenins and Trotskys and radicals committed to the overthrow of government? Let's start with Samuel Orr. What became of him? Yeah, he became a judge. <laughs> That would be Fiorella LaGuardia swearing him in. How about Charlie Solomon? Another dangerous radical. What became of him? Yup, you guessed it. He became a judge too. <laughs> and in fact, when he died in 1963, the New York Times, which condemned him in the most unsparing language, eulogized him as a fighter for social justice in all of its forms. Another socialist, August Clasens, became one of the grand old men along with Norman Thomas. Some people might remember Norman Thomas of the Socialist Party. He was an educator. He traveled the country and delivered lectures. When he died in 1954, a thousand people packed an auditorium to sing his praises. Hundreds who couldn't get in were outside and heard the events. He wrote his biography. He lived a life in which he had lots of fun. How about Samuel DeWitt? What happened to this dangerous radical who must have believed in Marxist views about personal and private property? Yeah, he became very rich. <laughs> he operated a cutting tool company, and he was an accomplished poet. When you leave tonight at the back, we have books written by these people. He wrote over 10 volumes of poetry. He was highly respected. Um, for his literary exploits, and even though he made a lot of money in New Jersey running this company, he remained committed to liberal causes. Lewis Waldman, the fifth socialist, um, perhaps the most prominent in legal circles, he was the founder of the Vladek Waldman Law Firm, a great labor law firm. He became a pillar of the bar. Uh, he became a Republican. He was president of the Brooklyn, Brooklyn Bar, vice president of the City Bar, chair of the State Bar's Committee on Civil Rights, and chair of the ABA Committees on American Citizenship. And how about Charles Evans Hughes? Friends, family, thought he was risking his career. Heaven forbid he speak out against socialists. He didn't do so bad. Warren Harding got elected president. He made him secretary of state. He served with great distinction in that office ultimately became a judge of the Permanent Court of International Justice. And as President McNamara points out, he became Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court, widely regarded as one of the three great chiefs in American history. All right, a word or two about legacy. What does this all mean today? Well, I think there are at least three important legacies or lessons. One is that what Hughes and the Organized Bar did is of a piece with the great tradition of American law and lawyers representing unpopular causes. It has a proud provenance in American history. You can trace it back at least as far as John Adams in 1770, when he represented British soldiers accused of being perpetrators to the um, Boston Massacre. He believed in the rule of law. There was no person more committed, more opposed to the British occupation than John Adams. He became president because of that. Uh, he was a true patriot during the revolutionary period, but he represented and got the British soldiers acquitted. You see this idea of representing unpopular causes as well with Clarence Darrow in the Scopes trial. John Scopes was a teacher in Dayton, Tennessee, who taught evolution in violation of a recently enacted statute. Jews went down there, received brutal criticism in the media and elsewhere in the South, and he valued and mounted a defense for John Scopes. There's another legacy. Our leadership in tumultuous times. What do I mean by that? 
you know, the debates that took place on the floor of the city bar and also the state bar association, many people rose and said, the association shouldn't take a stand. These issues were too political. Membership might decline. We might make people unhappy. Well, Hughes proved then and teaches us all today about the importance to stand up when fundamental principles are at stake. And you don't have to just look at American history to know what happens when lawyers don't do that. In the 1930s in Germany, which had a robust legal system, when the Nuremberg Laws were enacted, when laws were enacted prohibiting Jews from being lawyers, what did the Berlin Bar Association do? Nothing. That is not the example of Charles Evans' use and what he teaches us today. And perhaps, at least for me, the most enduring and the most important lesson, legacy, you can see when you look at current events today. Look around us, right? We see political turmoil. We see fear and hate. In 1920, it was radicals. Today, we see the same kinds of scapegoating of immigrants or persons who live in Mexico who want to come to the United States. We're told to be fearful of that, that caravans pose existential threats to our country. Those were the kinds of things that were said about radicals in 1920. We've been here before. The good news is that fear can be replaced by hope. That paranoia, xenophobia, racism, ignorance, selfishness, greed can be defeated. But it is not automatic. It cannot be assumed that the forces of evil will be defeated. It requires an informed citizenry capable of witness and protest. And most of all, it requires leadership. Leadership like the kind exhibited by Charles Evans Hughes and the organized bar. That's why all of us are here this evening, nearly 100 years after the events I spoke about today, to honor the extraordinary courage of Hughes and the lawyers and our three great bar associations who stood up for principle. And that's why all of us in this room tonight should resolve to be equally courageous, to be equally fearless in meeting the challenges of our time. Thank you so much for your time. This